Namaste and good evening. Our distinguished guest and the author of uh, the book, Ambassador Sujan Chinoy, Sri Rajiv Gandhi, Secretary of AMA, Dr. Savan Goryawala, Vice President of AMA, all the past presidents, Mr. Amit Shukla, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Ahmedabad Management Association, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to this book launch event. The book title, World Upside Down, written by Ambassador Chinoy, whom we, we are really privileged to have with us today and also on past occasions where several times he came to AMA and each one of his addresses has been a real treat and an enlightening experience. The world is constantly changing since the World War II in terms of the geopolitics. Decolonization, then communism, then the Cold War, the non-aligned movement, and then post-90s, it was the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the unification of Germany, and of course, on the Indian side, the liberalization of our Indian economy, and so many other factors. The world order has changed from bipolar to unipolar, and now it's a multipolar world. For more than a decade, India has emerged playing a key role in international geopolitics due to many factors, such as its growing economy, its advancement in science, technology, manufacturing, services, its ability to build world-class institution, and most important, India's strong diplomatic engagement. Yes, all this and much more is covered in the book, and we are eager to listen to Ambassador Sujan Chinoy. And incidentally, Ambassador Chinoy was a co-editor of an anthology of essays on a very similar topic, and this compendium was also released a few months ago. Ambassador Chinoy, I express my gratitude for your presence today, and I also thank Mr. Rajiv Gandhi and to initiate and support this event in all possible ways. May I now request Mr. Mukesh Patel, our past president, to talk about Ambassador Chinoy's relationship with AMA and our Japan Center, Center activities. Thank you. Konbanwa, minasan. The Japanese flavor is all pervasive here in this magnificent premises of the Ahmedabad Management Association. And I'm here to greet and welcome our patron advisor of the Indo-Japan Friendship Association. And we've been so privileged to have Ambassador Sujan Chinoy as our friend, philosopher, and guide in our vision, mission, and passion to do so many things relating to Japan here at AMA, in Ahmedabad, Gujarat, and of course, India. Friends, I was telling him, because he's been a very dear old friend from the 70s and in fact he always reminds me because i cannot forget it that he is one of our founder members of the indo japan friendship association which was started in those days and i'm so glad that not just india's but probably the world's longest running student exchange program which celebrated its golden jubilee, 50 years in 2021, since the program started in 1970-71, we have shared our common bonds being an alumni. And I know so many of you in this auditorium are also what we call as Sujan Sakura Club members. Friends, Whenever I go to Japan and the word Sujan Chinoy 
comes up, the name Sujan Chinoy comes up, immediately it rings in the minds and hearts of so many people. Over all these years, with all humility, I would say, because Sujan is very humble, but what he did as ambassador of India in Japan during his three years tenure from 2015 to 2018 is acknowledged and acclaimed as almost what could have been done or what was done in more than two decades, friends. He de deserves a tremendous round of applause because if these two greats, Modinomics and Abenomics, you know, the, confu the, the, the confluence of that had to take place. The one man with his vision and mission who built the bridge between the two, it was Ambassador Sujan Shinoy. And friends, he extended his warmth and his graciousness to us as well. Because these three years from 2015 to 2018 saw spectacular things happening in this very campus. The visit of Madame Akiabe, the signing of the sister state agreement between Yogo and Gujarat, the, the signing of the sister city agreement between Kobe and Ahmedabad. I could go on naming. And all these illustrious events took place through his initiative, guidance, and patronage. So we are extremely happy that you are here. We know how busy you are, Ambassador Sujan Chinoy, because you wear so many hats. In fact, I was just telling him in the lighter vein that he should now have his visiting card like a Japanese fan, you know, because as many folds, he could have things that he could write on about that. Of course, to talk about that, I'm going to invite my friend uh, and his dear friend of RKC, Amit Shukla. But uh, before I take my seat, I would say that uh, as we look forward to celebrate our golden jubilee of our association, of which you are the patron advisor. And we cannot forget the honors that the prime minister himself did inaugurating our landmark Zen Kaizen. Uh, here we have many more miles to go. And just to share and end with this beautiful couplet of one of my favorite shires, if we get hand in hand with a person like Ambassador Sujan Chinoy, you are bound to be blessed because he'll show you the way and take you away miles together. As the Shire said, Hame sahel ho gai manzile, hawa ke rukh bhi badal gai. Hame sahel ho gai manzile, hawa ke rukh bhi badal gai. Thank you. And friends, let us welcome him with a thunderous round of applause. And uh, my friends at AMA, why don't we give him a standing ovation for all that he has done for us over these years. And pray that he continues to do so. I was telling him this this houseful auditorium on a working day at 5.30 only speaks volumes for the love and admiration that you command. Thank you, Rajivai, for making this event possible. And I now invite Amit Shukla to please come and formally introduce Ambassador Chinoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mukesh Bhai. 
When Rajiv Gandhi requested me to introduce Ambassador Sujin Chinoy, I was thrilled. As I've known him since 1973, uh, during my time at the Rajkumar College in Rajkot. And this just seemed so natural for me to come and say a few words about him. Thank you, Rajiv. Ambassador Chinoy is a distinguished figure in the realm of international diplomacy with a career that spans over three decades in the foreign service. His career trajectory reflects his commitment to strengthening India's diplomatic ties and enhancing its role on the global stage. He is well respected for his deep expertise on East and Southeastern Asian geopolitical affairs. Presently, he is the Director General of Manohar Parikh Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis since 2019. He is the current chair of the Think 20 Engagement Group for India's G20 Presidency. A career diplomat from 1981 to 2018, he held several important diplomatic assignments, to name a few, Ambassador to Mexico and Japan, India's Council General in Shanghai and Sydney, India's representative to the first committee at the UN in New York, director of India related affairs in New Delhi in the Ministry of External Affairs as a specialist on China, East Asia and politico military and security issues. Ambassador Chinoy has just been nominated to the distinguished nine member committee to explore the transformation of DRDO. This strategic move is a directive from Prime Minister Modi to revamp the DRDO, which consumes almost 7% of India's defense spending. The objective, in my opinion, is possibly to revolutionize the landscape of Indian defense management, thereby enhancing its efficiency, preparedness, and adaptability to meet contemporary challenges. He's a member of the Padma Awards Selection Committee since 2021. Due to his NCC background, the National Cadet Corps, Ambassador Chinoy has been appointed as member of the Governing Council of the NCC Alumni Association of India, headed by the Raksha Mantri, and its first member was none other than our Prime Minister. He's a prolific writer, contributes to newspapers and journals, and has a packed lecture circuit across India and overseas. The book being launched today is an anthology of his writings over the past three to four years. This is just one such outcome of his writings. He is fluent in English, Chinese, Mandarin, and conversant in French, Spanish, German, Japanese, Arabic, Urdu, and French, Creole. I hope I got that right. Oh yes, and Hindi and Gujarati. <laughs> He's excellent at rifle shooting at a national level at once upon a time, and tent pegging. It's a precision sport on horseback that requires one to nimbly control a galloping horse that inherently has a mind of its own. This, this is basically, an, it turns horse riding into an art form. Now, all these positions and achievements makes one wonder where he came from. It begs that question. What are the layers in his foundations, ones that supported him to build a solid rock of himself today? Ambassador Chinoy is a proud son of Gujarat, grandson of Barrister C. N. Chinoy, the Diwan of Rajkot State then, and son of Sri Ramesh and Srimati Usha Chinoy. His father was an IPS officer, a stickler to rules, who was his idol and inspiration. He developed his love for sitar and outdoors and horseback riding from his father. His father had a natural talent to music. Sitar was his favorite, but he naturally found himself to be playing 20 different musical instruments without any formal training. That showed his natural inclination to music. Mrs. Chinoy was a trained classical singer, a class A artist with All India Radio. She was also a teacher at the Rajkumar College in Rajkot, where Sujan Bai spent his formative years. Talking about Mrs. Chinoy, she was my class teacher while I was at RKC in grade three. I still remember her face very well. 
Ambassador Sujan credits his school RKC in a large part for shaping him in his early years and for all he did and did not do in the years ahead. RKC instilled in him a drive to excel. Besides academics and NCC, he was lead sitar player and won several music prizes in successive years. He still plays the sitar. He gave a public performance in Mexico with his rendition of Raghupati, Raghav, and uh, Vaishnava Janato Tene Chahiye. He did that with just three months of practice in Mexico. From school, he went to MS University in Varodra, where he pursued English literature, and where, in his words, the pupa blossomed into a butterfly. He excelled in swimming, made the Baroda aquatic team, took up bodybuilding, was the second runner-up at the Junior Mr. Gujarat Championship. He continued with NCC levels B and C further at, at college, won the best cadet Gujarat state and excelled in 303 rifle shooting at the national level in 1997. I'm sorry, 1977. The NCC instilled in him discipline that he lives by even today. Amongst his defense meetings, whenever people comment on his discipline and his, and his approach to everyday uh, scheduling and all, he says NCC is the is the reason that has instilled that discipline in him. And he lives by it even today. He went further to gain an MBA from BK School of Management in Ahmedabad. With his exposure and experience, it is no wonder that he is the go-to person for the Indian government on boundary equations and is, and is a reliable wicket keeper for this job. Today, he says he has more drive than when he was 25. He has miles to go before he hangs up his boots. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Ambassador Sujin Kumar. Thank you very much for that elaborate uh, introduction. I invite Ambassador Sujan Chinoy for his theme address. But before that, I request Rohit Bhai Patel, our past president, to come up and greet uh, Sujan Bhai with a bouquet of flowers. Thank you, Rohit Bhai. I invite Ambassador Chinoy for his theme address. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Namaskar. I want to begin by firstly expressing a profound thanks to Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, Mr. Mukesh Patel, Mr. Devyesh Radia, Mr. Amit Shukla, Savan Bhai, and all those who have made it possible for us to be here together this evening. Let me tell you, it's very difficult to speak before an audience such as this, especially if you have schoolmates in the audience. <laughs> there are people here this evening who have seen me nearly 58 years ago as a six-year-old boy. They know all about me. There's nothing I can do to impress them. It's also very difficult to impress an audience when there are people in the audience who have been with you at college, from the BK School of Business Management. There's a whole row full of my esteemed classmates there. So try as I might, this evening is going to be an uphill task for me. And twice in my life, I began my journey here in this great city of Ahmedabad. Once when I had no choice, I was born here. But once when I had a choice, which is when I came after my graduation in Baroda to Ahmedabad, and no Chandan, I don't regret having to spend time with you in college as well. <laughs> and I spent two beautiful years of my life 
here again, 1978 to 1980. And I was also reminded by Mr. Mukesh Patel's generous praise, the fact that uh, he recalls very clearly that I am one of the founding members of the Indo-Japan Friendship Association. And try as he might, he did not succeed in getting me to pay my membership dues again when he made me the patron of the organization. For like a good Gujarati, I keep my accounts well and I had the receipt on my files. But thank you for that uh, gesture as well. Well, friends, when I left Ahmedabad in 1980, and that was a very long time ago, 43 years ago, the world was very different. We were still in the middle of the Cold War. We were still in an era where the Soviet Union had gone into Afghanistan, an era in which there were tensions between Iraq and Iran. And all that we know of the dismantling of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, the arrival of the unipolar decade of the 1990s, the phenomenal rise of China, all that lay ahead. And I, a good novice in the Foreign Service, lived through these times. Over the last four decades or more, I have therefore seen this world order, the global order changing, not always in a steady manner, often lurching, often unpredictably, often suddenly, but constantly. This book that I have written is essentially an anthology of many of my writings, plus some fresh writings that I attempted over the last few years. And it's written from a vantage point, which is unique. Because uh, when I hung up my boots in Tokyo, the Prime Minister had appointed me as the Director General of India's largest defense, national security, and international relations think tank. But more than that, I've had the singular privilege of working as part of the ecosystem over the last four and a half years. And therefore, one can say that I was able to look through the keyhole in the last four and a half years, not to speak of the 38 odd years that I spent in the Foreign Service, to see how the world has been changing. And truly, I read the conclusion that uh, it would be important for me to share my thoughts and writings with the people of this country, for these assessments cut quite close to the bone. For I have said in my book many things that government may not be in a position to say. But I'm quite sure many in government share the same views as I have put across in this compilation and book. And so let me begin with the basic premise that the title itself suggests that we live in a world which is in flux. It's a rapidly changing world. It is unrecognizable in part. It is a global order that was set up as we know it, the current global order at the end of the Second World War, when the victors took all the spoils. And for the first time in the history of the international community, an institution such as the United Nations was set up in the hope and belief that it would provide stability, a new kind of security architecture, a new kind of framework in which the international community could work on peace and progress and economic development. And to the victors went all the spoils. For when the Security Council was set up, it was set up with a degree of exceptionalism. And a very Anglo-Saxon or European looking team of victors added a bit of color by bringing in a large populous agrarian nation known then as the Republic of China, which had been one of the theaters during the conflict of the Second World War as also a permanent member of the Security Council. But that world has remained, remained frozen since then, but not entirely so. It is being challenged 
as a result of the shifting of the balance of power over the last several decades from Europe, where the traditional engines of growth resided in the past, to Asia in the last four decades. And we have seen this transformation taking place in an ineluctable manner, in an inevitable manner, aided and abetted by the phenomenal rise of China. But when we look at the world today, we see that it is increasingly, despite there being an existing global order that has survived structurally since 1945, we live in a world which is increasingly fractured. It is fragmented in part. It is fractured in part. And we have seen how it is very difficult for the existing framework to deliver in a cohesive, cooperative manner on some of the larger issues that confront humankind today. The larger issues and challenges of terrorism, of climate change, of economic recovery in the post-COVID pandemic era. These are things on which the global community is unable to develop consensus because of major power contestation. There is therefore a weakening of the global system as we know it, the existing global order. There is increased multipolarity, less of multilateralism, more of multi-alignment and issue-based alignment. And no single country today, as we see it, is in a position in a world that is drifting towards multipolarity, which is no longer a unipolar world of the type that prevailed in the 1990s after the demise of the Soviet Union, which is no longer a bipolar world of the type that we saw and experienced during the Cold War. In such a world, there is no single country that is able to make its writ felt on all issues at all times in all geographies. And so it is also the destiny of the United States, once a preeminent power, still a very potent power, still the world's largest military and the largest economy. It is quite clear that it no longer dominates in the manner in which it did. And this is because of the rise of China, for example. As a rising hegemon, it has challenged the existing hegemon, that is the United States of America. But it is also a period in which many other middle powers have found their niche, who are also growing exponentially and are increasingly able to develop greater elbow room for their own growth and development to make strategic choices based on autonomy. When I look back at the global structure, I'm reminded of the importance of maintaining peace and stability. That's the primary driver behind any global structure. In Europe, for example, in the 17th century, the Treaty of Westphalia was instrumental in creating certain structures to provide peace and stability. It resulted, for example, by the second half of the 19th century in a united Germany, a Germany that by 1871 was not only united, but also extremely uh, big an economy under the leadership of uh, Bismarck. It was also a period in which Japan, after being forced open by Commodore Perry, had decided to learn the ways of the West, to acquire Western technologies, and to repeat the performance for the first time in Asia. And so by the time you get to the end of the 19th century, the global order is already in flux, with the rise of a major power in Europe, such as Germany, in Asia, a Japan that had not only risen, but was also increasingly militarizing in such manner that when Rabindranath Tagore went to Japan, he had written uh, fearfully about the potential for conflict in the future if Japan continued down the same path. As the 20th century unfolded, we saw that a militarized Germany was actually challenging Great Britain, a country that had an empire of its own, one that dominated the high seas, and there was a naval conflict between, uh, an arms race between Germany and Britain that continued well through the opening decade or two of the 20th century. As it was, these major power contestations led to the First World War. The First World War was devastating, but it was not planned. It was not the type of structure that we 
claim to attribute today to the quadrilateral security dialogue that there is uh, the making of a treaty alliance partnership in the Indo-Pacific today that is out to contain China. There was no such thing during the First World War. The UK, for example, uh, joined battle in 1914. Italy joined in 1915. The United States joined on, only in 1917 after the Battle of Jutland. Uh, and it was therefore a war that evolved. This is something that is still possible in the 21st century. That there are no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. There are permanent interests. And based on the impact that the global situation has on a nation's interests, nations decide whether they are on one side or the other. And this is increasingly a feature of our world that is upside down, no longer recognizable, no longer predictable in the same manner. After the end of the First World War, a disastrous war, an attempt was made, as you are all aware, through the Treaty of Versailles to bring about peace. But it too failed. It failed to rein in the urge, uh, the frustrations that powers like Japan and Germany had. The League of Nations the following year was also an ill-conceived attempt to create a global structure akin to what followed later in the United Nations. It too failed to keep peace, primarily because the greatest economy by then on earth, not yet the greatest military power, that's the United States of America, did not fully support the League of Nations. Commitment to global structures matter at the end of the day. How seriously we take these structures, how seriously we take the United Nations today, how seriously do the permanent members take the United Nations? This matters in determining whether the United Nations still is good enough for the world that we live in today. And we have seen how after the failure of both the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations, the lid could not be kept uh, on uh, the pot and it led to the militarization once again of Germany and Japan, ultimately to the catastrophic Second World War. And the Second World War gave rise to the first and the only example of a peaceful transition and transfer of power from a reigning hegemon to a rising hegemon. In that case, a depleted, enervated Great Britain, exhausted by the travails of the Second World War, exhausted by the demands uh, of Swaraj and independence in India, giving way peacefully to the rise of the United States of America. That is the structure that still prevails today. But is it fair? Is it a structure that provides for the aspirations of the global community today? Does it account for powers that have risen since then? The answer is no. For we have seen that the post-1945 world order moved very quickly into the era of the Cold War. Within two years of the end of the Second World War, the Cold War was raging by 1947 between the Soviet Union uh, and the East Bloc and the uh, you know, West Bloc uh, led by the United States. We went through a long period, a bipolar world in which these two countries decided and these two blocs decided the state of affairs at the international level. A contrasting feature today is that uh, never before during the Cold War did the two competing sides have economic interdependence between them. They were able to work together on some of the key issues, such as, for instance, nuclear uh, you know, weapons and reductions and, and treaties to that effect. But they did not depend on one another for economic activity. But today, the world is vastly different. Today, the rising hegemon that is China and the reigning hegemon that is the United States of America are linked intrinsically to one another. They are like Siamese twins. They are conjoined at the hips. One cannot think of economic prosperity without the other. And this mutual interdependence also makes for a restricted spectrum of strategic choices, especially for the United States of America, which stands for a free and open world, the liberal trading order, which looks at the freedom of navigation and overflight as basic principles in our part of the world and elsewhere. So we are looking at a, a vastly changed world in which the existing structures have not truly changed. When the Soviet Union collapsed uh, in 1991, it gave rise to 
a brief interlude of a decade, 10 years in which the United States of America, a hyperpower, stood all by itself in splendid isolation at the top of the heap. But that era lasted only 10 years. Tensions between China, which had overcome the difficulties and contradictions of uh, global isolation in the immediate aftermath of Tiananmen, had recovered and was already nipping at the heels of the United States of America. And by 2001, uh, ironically, with the fullest help from the United States of America, China enters into the WTO because the United States by 1999 had given full normal trading status to the People's Republic of China, even though it was not a market economy. And by 2001, China enters the WTO and there's no looking back. China's phenomenal rise, uh, particularly after 1990, even more so after its entry into the WTO, has made for a major contradiction in the global order. It has put a great challenge because China's rise has not been very predictable. It's not been very smooth. It's not been without challenge. China's rise, particularly its unilateralism, its use of immense economic power to militarize and to call in question the existing global order to suit its requirements is one of the biggest challenges that my book explores. We have seen how the UN Security Council failed to reform. Over the past seven decades or more, the United Nations saw very little of reforms. The only time that the United Nations made a small effort at reform was in 1961, when the ECOSOC, the council that dealt with this subject, decided that it was time to bring about some change, to bring about greater representation, to democratize the UN Security Council. And it took four years to get to 1965. And that too resulted only in a cosmetic change when the non-permanent category of the UN Security Council was expanded and the total numbers went up from 11 to 15. It has since frozen in time. It has remained frozen. There has been no further change since then. When we look at the other attributes of the existing global order, the global order that we still value, one that we do not want to challenge, one that it would be unwise to challenge, but one which we must demand makes itself subject to genuine reforms is also the Bretton Woods structures like the IMF and the World Bank. We cannot speak of a level playing field if in the IMF, a single country like the United States of America has what you call voting rights in excess of 17%. And if the IMF's charter itself says that you need a full 85% of votes for a consensus to develop, it is obvious that one country, therefore, can stall any kind of change. This is particularly relevant because in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic, uh, particularly the Ukraine war, when there's been a great disruption with regard to supply chains, it is vitally important for the global community to work together. Without there being some consensus, it's virtually impossible to address the distress that is felt by 75 countries or more with regard to their economic well-being in the aftermath of two major challenges, the COVID-19 pandemic as well as the war in Ukraine. Ladies and gentlemen, when we look at the world today, we see that it is recognizable as the same order that was put in place in 1945. In many ways, it still is the same, but in many ways, it is not the same. Things have changed because power has got more distributed throughout the world. If we look at the rise of China being a point of inflection, for example, in the changing global order, it is not as if the rest of the world has been marking time while China has risen. But this is the point that China fails to understand. We are aware of the fact that the global engines of economic growth shifted over the last 30 or 40 years to our part of the world, to Asia. In Asia, we have seen how Japan rose from the ashes of the Second World War, Phoenix-like, to take up a new role, a new avatar as a manufacturing hub for the rest of the world by the time uh, we get to the 1960s. We have seen how the Asian tigers benefited thereafter from that great big connect between manufacturing hubs in Asia, whether in Southeast Asia, whether in Japan, whether in Korea, whether in Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, 
and that one big great market across the Pacific, that is the United States of America. We have seen how in the late 1970s, China too benefited from that great big connect between Asia and the United States of America, between hubs uh, devoted to manufacturing in Asia and that big market. The benevolent touch of that market can actually uh, change the destiny of many manufacturing powers. We have seen that in the case of China. And yet we have realized today that China finds it very difficult to adjust to these changes. China as today the world's second largest economy. It is a $19 trillion economy and may overtake the United States in the near future. It demands that the rest of the world adapt to its rise and adjust for the phenomenal accretion in China's power. But China fails to recognize that while China has been growing, the rest of the world, particularly neighboring countries like India, others in Southeast Asia, whether the Philippines, whether Thailand, whether Indonesia, even Bangladesh, all the way up to the littoral of the Indian Ocean and the dynamic economies of Africa, they too have been growing. To deny the relative achievement of these countries is also to deny equality, to deny equal opportunity in this kind of a shift of balance of you know, manufacturing and, and economic progress towards our part of the world. And that is why in the course of my book, I have explored these themes, the Asia-Pacific versus the Indo-Pacific. Why is it that China is wedded to the concept of the Asia-Pacific? After all, the Asia-Pacific is a concept, as I said, which appeared after the end of the Second World War because of that great connect between manufacturing hubs in Asia and a big market in the United States of America. But after 2001, no doubt China has grown, but countries like India have also grown. And the Indo-Pacific, in my view, therefore, in the current context where virtually everyone in the region has a vision for the Indo-Pacific, this concept that unites two large geographies, the Indian Ocean littoral, the Pacific Ocean littoral, all the economies in between, the continental spaces, the South China Sea, intervening spaces are all one today. This is something that is more representative. It is more democratic. It is more in tune with the aspirations of many more people around the world. And therefore, it is a concept that needs further elaboration. I'm not surprised that the Chinese would challenge this concept because their centrality lay in continued use of the term Asia-Pacific. When it comes to the Indo-Pacific, the People's Republic also must share space with others, including India. Let me also mention that in virtually every geography that you see today, there are seven factors which I describe as the seven T's that challenge the existing global order and pose fresh you know, challenges, create more friction between major powers. These are trade, Technology, territorial differences, uh, you have uh, terrorism, that's the fourth T, tenets as in narratives, principles, values as the fifth T, transparency or the lack of it as the sixth T, and finally, a big T that is absent, that is the T of trust. And if you explore each of these themes, you will see that these are equally applicable to the Indo-Pacific, they are equally applicable to Sino-US relations, to India-China relations, to Ukraine and the European theater where, you know, uh, existing security paradigms have been completely upended for the first time in seven decades. Why do I say so? I say this because trade is something that is an offshoot. Burgeoning trade has been an offshoot of globalization. But not all countries have benefited equally from the process of globalization. Some countries have gamed the system much more than others, which is why the WTO lies today in shambles with its appellate authority also unable to get the work done with regard to you know, facilitation of trade or dispute settlement. Trade is fungible. Trade is very difficult for governments to control, which is why this whole concept of decoupling from uh, an adversary like China has proved to be very difficult for the United States. By the way, it's proved very difficult for India. It's proved very difficult for Japan. It's proved very difficult for Australia. Imagine all the quadrilateral security dialogue countries have found, ironically, their trade 
with China burgeoning in the aftermath of all the friction that has been seen in recent years. That's because trade is not handled out of the Pentagon or the State Department or South Bloc or the Sachivalais anywhere. They are handled by people like you sitting in the audience. This has to do with the structural nature and characteristics of various economies, the kind of supply chains that require to be uh, you know, nurtured in order to import and export to survive. And therefore, trade has been difficult to control. People are now using the term de-risking. But this de-risking also has been far more successful with regard to the second T, the T of technology. Now, that's where the game changes because technology, especially high-end technology, is not something that is made at home. Billions of dollars go in, large corporates put in money. These work closely with government, sometimes government agencies and departments uh, like DARPA, for instance, in the United States in defense technologies, they pour in billions of dollars. This is something that can be controlled with regard to export controls, with regard to sanctions. And you're seeing that war unfold today between the United States and China. China benefited from U.S. technologies for a full half century after the reset in the 1970s brought about by, you know, Henry Kissinger and his patron, President Nixon. That 50-year strategic partnership has completely unraveled in recent times. And now the United States is taking steps, corrective steps. It had lost uh, the plot. It was sleeping at the wheel. I could use a number of such phrases to describe U.S. behavior. It had dropped the ball. It had taken its eye off the ball. It had created a vacuum. Nature abhors the vacuum. The Chinese stepped into that vacuum, especially in the Asia-Pacific, uh, when the United States was... Uh, primarily focused on the international war on terror in the opening decade of this century. But all that literally means that the United States today is taking corrective action through the Inflation Reduction Act, through the CHIPS Act, through the Science Act, pouring in billions of dollars to rectify that. French shoring, onshoring. The whole idea is to bring back manufacturing, to take the initiative once again into their own hands. And mind you, I do believe that the United States the world's largest economy, still the most potent, uh, still with the most potent technologies, has it in itself to, to keep that lead in, in, in cutting-edge technologies vis-a-vis -vis the United, uh, vis-a-vis -vis the People's Republic of China. Even if China were to overtake the United States of America in terms of nominal GDP, size of the GDP, China will never be able to match the per capita GDP of the United States. China will perhaps never be able to match the innovative capacities in science and technology, in defense technologies that the U.S. is capable of. So trade and technology have been uh, areas of contestation. They have been weaponized like never before. The world also imagined that we should be able to uh, deal with territorial differences and resolve them through peaceful means. But we have seen that territorial disputes have a way of their own of disrupting peace and security. We have seen that explosion uh, in Europe, in Ukraine. And many people say that, uh, you know, these are black swan events. I mean, COVID-19 was also not a black swan, swan event. It was a gray rhino event. Everyone knew that the next pandemic is, is around the corner. Were you prepared? Did you make policies for it? Well, Ukraine was one such issue. Having read the tea leaves with regard to Russia's worldview when it came to its relations with Georgia, its claims over Moldova or uh, uh, you know, um, Abkhazia uh, or, or South Ossetia, um, its view on Crimea, uh, its view of Ukraine itself as, uh, as to whether it was a sovereign entity or not, the writing was on the wall. And territorial differences have actually fundamentally altered the nature of peace and security in the Indo-Pacific as well. Whether between China and Japan over the Senkakus, in the East China Sea, whether between China and the Southeast Asian countries, in the South China Sea, more fundamentally from our point of view, territorial differences have defined the nature of India-China relations today. The fourth T of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, tenets uh, is also extraordinary uh, because uh, tenets are narratives. These are principles. These are values. And there is major power contestation today particularly in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, to prove that one's systems of social, political, economic, and cultural governance uh, are superior to that of the rest. 
And for the first time in the existing global order, you see a challenge coming from authoritarian states. Authoritarian states that were like China claiming that they had a better grip on the COVID-19 pandemic, short-lived claims, because we have seen after the disastrous, uh, you know, zero COVID policy that the Chinese economy has also greatly uh, floundered and, um, you know, faces a number of challenges today. Um, we have seen how terrorism is dividing the world today. Now, terrorism is something that 20 years ago was actually uniting the world. Uh, China was also cooperating with the United States against international terrorism in the aftermath of 9-11. But today you see the world is increasingly fractured uh, at the United Nations because countries like China are using their exceptionalism, their privileged power, veto power in the United uh, Nations Security Council to put a spanner in the works uh, by not allowing countries like the United States and India uh, to uh, successfully push through the global listing of terrorists of the uh, lashkar e toiba and the uh, you know jash e mohammed so you see that terrorism which should unite the world is dividing the world we are also seeing lack of transparency amidst all this it's very easy to look at statistics and say that we know all about the chinese economy we know how the pla has expanded its uh, air power it is now acquiring a third aircraft carrier we can do that kind of bean counting rather easily but it's very difficult to read intentions and motivations and that is where, because of an utter lack of transparency in the opaque system that China has, whether economic or military, it's very difficult to predict motivation, intention. We have the capabilities in place and that a combination of capabilities and unpredictable motivations makes for a very uncertain situation, especially at a time when the Chinese are uh, spilling over into other geographies. They're spilling over politically, they're spilling over in terms of their military power, naval power, a transition from a brown water navy to a blue water navy. And how do we handle that great challenge of China is one of the puzzles of our times. It is a China that is not ready to throw out the baby with the bathwater. It is not a China that is fundamentally challenging the existence of the current global order, for it is the same order that has given rise to China. It is the same order which allowed China, the People's Republic, to helicopter into the Security Council as a veto-wielding member in 1971 when the Republic of China, that is Taiwan, was kicked out for geopolitical reasons at a time of great reset between the United States and China in the hope that these two would work together to deal with an emerging threat from a rising Soviet Union at that time, which was pulling away in space, in, in atomic energy, in military power, etc., and so it is a China that is not about to say that we don't like the existing global order. But the Chinese do not uh, leave that uh, at, at that. The Chinese also say that the existing global order in part is imperfect. And they see this, they see this with a view to ensuring that the existing global order also increasingly accommodates their ambitions, their aspirations. They are also making an attempt to create parallel structures uh, in the likeness of China, those structures like the, uh, you know, AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or the New Development Bank of the BRICS, the expansion of the BRICS to bring in more members. This is an attempt, an ill-conceived attempt in reality to build a constituency of their own, own in the likeness of their own aims and objectives. And so China is riding two horses at the same time. Ours is a very complex relationship with China. And in the course of my book, I've tried to explain by way of a primer, a chapter on the India-China relationship, which has undergone many challenges. Uh, in many ways, sometimes when I look back at the 42-year career that I've had dealing with, for example, the People's Republic. By the way, my ancestors dealt with China 200 years ago. I'm basically a Shah masquerading as a Chinoy. Uh, 200 years ago, one Seth Nanji Jekaran Shah of Mangrol uh, was uh, the first to set up the Gujarati community in Kolkata. And many years ago, the late uh, Sri S.S. Kanoria, who was also uh, president of FIKI in the old days, brought me uh, a lot of material from Kolkata uh, about this uh, sixth generation ancestor of mine, who not only founded the Gujarati community there, but also went on to live in China for 12 years. And Seth Nanji Jekaran Shah 
I must tell you this story. Um, for 12 years, he lived there. He prospered. By the way, he was in Shanghai. By the way, he spoke very good Chinese. Uh, my late mother used to think that I am Nanji Jekran Shah reincarnate. <laughs> but I do believe in, in reincarnation. Um, but the funny thing about Nanji Jekran Shah was that he was such a disciplined man. Um, he did very well in China for 12 years. I'm, I'm talking about 1822 roughly to 1834. Uh, but when he comes back, uh, he comes back with three ships laden with goods. Uh, it had cannon on board in those days because you had to pass through the, you know, piracy infested waters of Southeast Asia uh, through the Malacca and things like that. And when he reached the shores of India, he was so elated with emotion at uh, seeing the shores of his motherland again that he ordered all the cannon on board to fire a salvo in salute to the motherland. The British garrison thought that uh, they were about to be attacked uh, by some pirates. So they sent out gunboats, had this poor man surrounded, arrested. His goods were confiscated. He was put into, uh, you know, the uh, locker uh, room for a while. Uh, he was uh, uh, interrogated. Uh, but to be fair to the British, they understood when uh, our old man explained that he was simply acting out of, you know, emotion at being back home. He donated a large amount of his money uh, to building a Jain Derasar, which still stands in Palitana. Those of you who are Jains may want to go there. I haven't been able to make it, uh, but I must uh, travel to Palitana to see the uh, Nanji Chinai Chaumukhi Derasar, Nanji Shah Chaumukhi Derasar. It still stands there. Uh, and it was built with the uh, funds donated uh, nearly 200 years ago uh, of my ancestor. I have no lien over that uh, Derasar, don't worry. <laughs> Um, and um, it is uh, because, you see, you all think that KYC is a modern concept, know your customer and all that. But the Jain Derasas invented the whole concept of KYC. You cannot donate to uh, uh, a Jain Derasa without their asking you a million questions about where you got the money from, what did you do, uh, how did you transfer it, etc. And so the meticulous and copious records kept uh, in that Derasa in the 1960s. There was a Jain Muni who was a scholar and he was doing a book on early traders of the west coast of India that traded with East Asia. And he fell upon my old man, my sixth generation ancestor, and his stories with great enthusiasm. There was so much material in those books. So I recall that uh, around 1965 or 1966, this scholar Muni came down to Rajkot uh, to our ancestral bungalow, which still stands there. Uh, and told my father that uh, I have done a book on your ancestor and here are 10 copies. And so I have those 10 copies. Uh, in fact, in my forthcoming book somewhere, I want to put in uh, a translation uh, of some of the chapters. But coming back to China, we always sought good relations with China. My book explores that theme. But can you have international relations where India has a positive policy towards China, but China has a negative policy towards India? Well, I'm afraid that's the situation in which we find ourselves. For all the protocols and agreements that we put in place, people like me worked for four decades to put in place confidence building measures, uh, you know, uh, building some kind of trust in the India-China border areas, uh, clarification and confirmation of the line of actual control and so on and so forth. These have actually been shattered on the harsh and cold rocks of Galwan in Ladakh in June 2020. We have a very complex relationship. Our current position is that we must restore normalcy in the India-China border areas for there to be trust, enough to be able to claim normalcy in the rest of the relationship. We can normalize the existence of differences that take time to resolve. We can normalize the existence of differences such that we have to continue negotiating for decades together, but we cannot normalize bloodshed. We cannot normalize bloodshed in the India-China border areas and then pretend ostrich-like that the rest of the relationship, as the Chinese want us to do, uh, you know, is to go back to normalcy in terms of people-to-people uh, -people ties and uh, political-level dialogue. So it's a very complex relationship which we must look at closely. Um, friends, I think I've spoken at length. I do not want to uh, go beyond the uh, allocated time. Suffice it to say that if there are things... Uh, that you have, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, caught on to. There are thoughts that have been bestirred by my remarks. 
uh, then these, uh, I'm afraid, we can pick, pick up these themes further in the course of the conversation. I can see that Rajiv Bhai is actively waiting to ask me a few questions, uh, which may be very hard for me to answer. But let me tell you, frankly, it's quite comical to say this, but I thoroughly enjoyed reading my own book. <laughs> and I learned a great deal. <laughs> the funny thing is that a week or two ago, I was told that I have to speak about my book and I was petrified. I said, look, I wrote that, but I've forgotten all about it. <laughs> so it was like going back to my college days, to my UPSC days. I said, where's that book? And I snatched a copy, uh, you know, uh, from my uh, shelf at home and I poured over it in the course of one evening and the next morning. But the funny thing was that it was a very racy read. And 270 pages, I devoured them, uh, almost objectively like a third person reading somebody else's book. And I did that uh, by the morning. And my event, uh, lo and behold, was quite successful. And as I said, I learned a great deal by reading my own book. But uh, uh, honestly, I, I, I put it down because I thought it would benefit uh, the younger generation at the school level or the university level, UPSC aspirants. But why just them? Also people who are in business. See, today, what's happening in the country and what's happening externally, these cannot be delinked. You're operating in an environment in which these are uh, to be contextualized. These are linked. Uh, external policies impact on your you know, domestic situation and vice versa. And it is also very important uh, to understand that the world of business today is increasingly subject to uh, geopolitical uh, developments. The impact of uh, geostrategic developments and geopolitical differences has a way of adversely impacting uh, the business world as well. We have seen that. Virtually every known vector of globalization, you would note, has been disrupted recently. Uh, the Ukraine war, uh, we speak about the disruption to food, fertilizer, and uh, you know fuel. There's also the fourth F of, of uh, finance. Uh, total disruption there. Uh, we have seen how globalization, if we talk about key vectors such as trade, technology, finance, and movement of human resources, these were also disrupted, not the least by the COVID-19 pandemic. So what happens out there is of concern. It's better to understand it fundamentally before you take uh, geoeconomic decisions of the type that any large corporation today must take. Uh, why did I say geoeconomic decisions? Because sitting out here in business today, you cannot say, I will operate in my cocoon. Nary a thought for supply chains. I have no clue about uh, what you mean by you know, manufacturing hubs of uh, imports and exports and tariffs and weaponization of, of tariffs, uh, non-tariff barriers, technical barriers to trade, phytosanitary standards. I mean, you can, as the Chinese have done, you can jinx the export of Indian agricultural products to China, despite our having the potential to export, by resorting to such things. So business people have to understand why we excel at IT in the United States of America, uh, why we are able to export uh, a very large quantum of our IT goods and services to the, to the United States, but we can't repeat that performance in China. For that part of geoeconomics is subject to geopolitics. Uh, so it's very simple. Uh, so I leave you with that thought uh, uh, in the hope that uh, we can interact uh, in the future as well. And, and I hope I have not overstayed my uh, kind of presence at the podium. But thank you very much. And thanks once again, all of you for coming here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sujan Bhai, for enriching us with your theme address and how you lucidly explain how the world order has changed over the 100 years. And shall I also say how your family transformed from Shah's to Chinois now, you know. So I'll invite our office bearers, um, Rajiv Bhai, Savan Bhai, and all the past presidents of AMA, and of course, Mr. Amit Shukla, to come up for the book launch. We'll do the book launch and then the conversation with uh, Raju Bhai will have with Sujan. Please. Please come on.
Yes, I'll now request our Secretary Rajiv Bhai in our today's event sponsor to start the conversation with Ambassador Sujan Chinoy and thereafter conduct the question and answer. Thank you. <laughs> so it was a uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, it was indeed a great. Uh, historical chronological uh, order of events that we could hear today right from uh, World War I up to nearly the current times and uh, I'm sure it has given a lot of additional information to each one of us sitting over here. So thank you very much for this great uh, uh, chronology of events. So, <laughs> I had a few questions which were related to the timeline, but most of it you gave it so elaborately that some of the questions have definitely become redundant. Uh, what I would like to ask you, Sujan Bhai, is, you know, more on what next? Um, and in fact, I personally feel that you would have to write a series of books like this time in, in recent time, you know, in the future time so that we all get updated and we call you and then you give us a complete, uh, uh, you know, download on historical events. I, I will soon inflict a, a sequel <laughs> yes. on all of you. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, uh, my first question is related to the G20, India's presidency. Uh, in the G20 and what is your assessment on this whole G20 and India's role, um, you know, with it taking it so aggressively? Never ever has the G20 summits been so much known and so much in public uh, knowledge and information ever. So uh, your assessment on it, sir. Thank you very much, Rajiv, for that uh, very important question. I mean, you uh, you know are aware that the G20 brings together 19 of the world's largest economies, one great area known as the European Union. Uh, and the G20 today is the largest single group that is capable of building consensus at the global level. At a time when the UN Security Council has abdicated its responsibilities with regard to the major challenges that face us, be it uh, economic recovery, be it addressing the financial distress felt by a very large part of the global south, be it uh, other issues to do with uh, gender equality, the achievement of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. We are at the halfway mark already. And by 2030, we are supposed to achieve in fulsome measure these SDGs. And we find that the existing global structures are incapable, increasingly subjected to major power contestation. They are incapable of delivery. And the G20 is really one big hope before the global community. To start with, it was never meant to address 
political issues. It was not meant to address geopolitical issues, but only economic issues. And it has done well in the past with regard to that. We have seen in the aftermath of the global financial and economic crises, especially when uh, around 2008, when it was elevated to the level of uh, uh, you know, heads of state and government, that the G20 has delivered on a number of issues. So as it's a rotating presidency, it is now India's turn. This year, we are about to finish. Um, we have done three-fourths of uh, our time. By the end of this year, we will hand over to Brazil. It's a genuine chance for India to show the right way forward, to refocus the global community's attention. And uh, by the way, India has done it in a splendid way. You're right in saying that never before has the G20 been taken to such heights. Never before has the G20 fired the imagination of more than 1.4 billion people. 1.4 billion people in India have been made aware of the external world through the G20. The world has been prepared for a rising India through the G20. So it is a, a phenomenal success, regardless of what comes out in the document at the end of uh, the uh, you know, uh, summit itself. What have we done? We have placed focus once again, front and center on gender equality, on reforms of uh, the United Nations and other Bretton Woods and other organizations, the multilateral development banks or the international financial institutions. We have brought focus back on things that we do best, which is what we call transparent and accessible digital public infrastructure. We've been able to share with the rest of the world through the course of the last one year, our best practices with regard to, for instance, the India stack uh, and uh, the Jandan, Aadhaar uh, and mobile uh, you know, platforms, the JAM, Trinity, the UPI. Uh, we do it at uh, the cheapest cost in and the most efficient manner uh, that can be done anywhere in the world. And so we have brought into focus, for instance, the one big challenge of our times, which is climate change. Uh, and uh, Prime Minister Modi himself has, uh, you know, uh, proposed lifestyle uh, for environment, now known as lifestyle for sustainable development, which is aimed at creating pro-planet people, which is aimed at telling us, as we are told on even flights now, that uh, the Prime Minister has proposed lifestyle for environment. What is that message? That message is that this great challenge of our times, climate change, and we will be irresponsible if we do not do something about it. If we leave future generations to grapple with something that will be devastating in consequence, we have been told to become more responsible in terms of our daily lives. So for me, uh, whether it is climate change, climate finance, to ensure a just and equitable green transition, uh, whether it is gender equality, whether it is digital public infrastructure, whether it is uh, you know, reform multilateralism, whether it's economic recovery, macroeconomic recovery, et cetera. Uh, this is something that India has been able to do very well. And we have emerged as a voice for the global community. India is not doing the G20 only for itself. It is speaking on behalf of the developing countries. If there's one voice today that is a credible voice for the global south, it is India. And we have a track record there. Whatever we have proposed in recent years, it has uh, uh, something that's pro bono whether it's the International Solar Alliance, whether it is the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, whether it is infrastructure for resilient island states, whether it is the one sun, one world, one grid concept, whether it is the International Day of Yoga. Um, and, and all of that uh, is something that we have been proposing, as you know, for global good. So uh, I think regardless of the summit and its outcomes, for me, the G20 has proved to be a huge success. Uh, uh, taking this on the same lines, now we have so many other uh, groups with a few countries in it, uh, with India taking a lead in BRICS, in, you know, in this G20, etc., all these things. Where is the United Nations going in? What about the current situation where India has been talking for a permanent seat in the Security Council and it's just not happening because of the veto powers that some hold? Then we have 
NATO, which is trying to expand its membership to areas which are far south of the Atlantic Ocean or west of the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, the Ukraine conflict, one of the things what we read is that uh, the, the NATO membership has also pushed the whole Ukraine conflict. So my question is, where is United Nations in all these things? And in with India playing such a re lead role and it not getting a permanent seat, do you think the United Nations will remain to be a strong voice. So that's a, a moot question. The future of the existing global order is defined by the post-World War II structures anchored in the United Nations. Will it continue? Will it deliver? That's the moot question. One fundamental premise for me is that global orders do not change easily. Global orders cannot be changed or dismantled very easily. They change as a result of catastrophic events, wars especially. That is what history has taught us. Global orders do not change out of the milk of human kindness because fine words are said in the you know, saloons of uh, the United Nations or in individual capitals demanding transparency and inclusivity, etc. Global orders, therefore, are very difficult to change. Now, here we have the classic example, a classic example of entrenched vested interests on the part of permanent members of the Security Council who would not want to share power, who would not want to, who are loath to see yet another member come in and demand equality, demand uh, an exceptional privileged veto power of the type that they have been used to wielding. You have seen that many of the permanent members are in fact depleted powers. I mean, we've already overtaken Great Britain in terms of the size of our economy. But truth to tell, uh, Russia is, uh, of course, 6,300 nuclear weapons uh, with uh, uh, thousands of uh, you know, ballistic missiles. But its economy is less than half that of India. And yet it sits there. Uh, and when the Chinese entered uh, you know, the UN Security Council, whether the Republic of China in 1945 or the People's Republic in 1971, they did not have uh, the kind of uh, economy uh, you know, that India has today. And yet India sits out with 1.4 billion people with uh, complete 100% uh, you know, commitment to the uh, principles of the UN Charter, having contributed immensely uh, to the welfare of the international community through, and we continue to do that through our vaccine, Maitri, and other assistance that we provide. Uh, our emphasis on bringing the African Union into the G20 once again demonstrates our, you know, outlook for the rest of the world. Uh, time and again, Prime Minister has been speaking of our vision of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, of, uh, you know, uh, one world, one family, one future. And there is no other country that is out there giving a new moral compass to the rest of the world as India is doing today. So I think the game has already moved away from the United Nations. Since the UN is not function functioning, it's dysfunctional to say the very least. There is an increasing tendency to go in for bilateralism or uh, plurilateralism or regionalism, working with like-minded partners. And many of these groups that you see uh, are a reflection of that. Now, the one unique feature of the world today is that there is a lot of hedging. There is a lot of multi-alignment. So when you look at these groups that you referred to, like the SCO and the BRICS, uh, these are, uh, uh, you know, in themselves uh, enigmatic at times. Uh, for example, in the BRICS today, uh, you have uh, uh, seen an expansion uh, at the latest uh, summit, uh, bringing in six additional countries. Um, and there were five already, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. South Africa having been added, uh, you know, a, a, almost a decade after BRICS came into existence. It came in only in 2010. Now you have an expansion with six more. Um, but of course, uh, this list is like what you call a common denominator. I mean, seriously, uh, would Ethiopia seriously contribute to uh, global geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, you know, themes. Um, so many of these structures today are overlapping. You find that uh, uh, countries that depend on the United States of America for their 
security well-being, uh, and by that I mean countries like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Turkey is a member of NATO, you'll find many of them voting with China when it comes to uh, human rights resolutions in Geneva. So it's a very complex world. From my point of view, uh, India is developing its own credibility. It has risen. It is destined to rise. We have entered the Amritkal period. Uh, whether uh, others like it or not, India is going to grow. It is going to be a country uh, that will take its rightful place uh, at the uh, head table uh, in the International Committee of Nations uh, within the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, and so we need not worry too much about groups. Our credibility goes beyond these groups. Uh, these groups are often themselves subject to geopolitical, uh, you know, most common denominator kind of uh, outcomes. In the SEO, for example, uh, we are there, Pakistan is there, uh, and China is there, the Central Asians are there, Russia is there, and there's only so much you can do when between large countries like India and China, you have so many differences. And I would imagine that same malaise would affect uh, the BRICS also to some extent. Um, and uh, as in the case of the UN Security Council, so also outside of it, this kind of friction will uh, you know, play its role. India will have to find its own pathway. And our credible pathway lies in continuing to do what we do best, which is we are trying to do the best by our people, but we are also trying to do our best for the rest of the world. So, thank you for that uh, comprehensive uh, reply. I think all your replies are so comprehensive that further questions in like itself book get reduced. <laughs> uh, now, talking on, again, this is in continuation. Um, we spoke about G20 and the United Nations. All this, it seems, is boiling down to the current diplomacy which has been uh, spearheaded by our Prime Minister and the way he has taken things forward. What is the difference between the current way of diplomacy in the current regime as against different from the earlier governments, the earlier Prime Ministers? Oh, that's a fair question to ask me because uh, I can say with conviction that I've seen it over exactly 42 years uh, on the trot um, uh, without having you know, uh, sort of uh, been out of the broader uh, ecosystem or the team for a day. So what I say, uh, I say with conviction. Oh, never before have I seen uh, in my life, uh, in my professional career, a prime minister who spends so much time trying to actually understand international affairs, uh, give uh, time to, uh, you know, policymakers to to do deep thinking, to formulate uh, ideas, suggestions, often directly to him, uh, and then to pick on the best of those ideas, run them through the collegiate of uh, government systems to bring about the best results. And uh, one very big difference is the ability to address complex issues uh, when leaders meet. I have seen that uh, uh, we are not beating about the bush uh, when it comes to complex issues. I mean, I'm tempted to draw a parallel. I hope you will not see it as, uh, uh, you know, pejorative remarks or churlish on my part to make this observation. But it's a fact of history that in the 1950s, soon after India and China came into a kind of modern contemporary existence, we were midwifed around the same time into existence in 1947 and 49 respectively. And overnight, our frontiers, those loose, uh, you know, broad swathes of territory that defined our periphery, overnight became boundaries because as nation states, we were looking for identity. And you can't have an identity without clear-cut borders. And so uh, it pitted India and China against each other uh, in, uh, you know, the border areas. And uh, very early on in the 50s, this friction uh, was very apparent. And when the Panchil Agreement was being negotiated between India and China in 1954, the instructions given by the political leadership at that time to the Indian negotiating team uh, were that, uh, please do not discuss the boundary question. If the Chinese were to raise this uh, vexatious and thorny issue of the boundary question, please disengage and come back. Now, I think 
that is not what we do today because one cannot afford to sweep complex issues under the carpet we have to tell it like it is if there are differences we have to sit across the table and discuss and i find that the, this leadership is doing that and not in an undiplomatic way with a full expression of desire for peace and cooperation in the finest possible gentlemanly manner we are able to put across key issues uh, this is not an india to be toyed with it's a new india india is confident it's on the rise it's also going to make it uh, it's it's uh, like the proverbial uh, tortoise and the the hare kind of story we will also get there um, and we might find somebody sleeping along the way so uh, the other thing i've noticed is this uh, incredible uh, ability to reach out to the rest of the world there are countries that have been visited in the last 9 years by the prime minister and his team core team including the foreign minister uh, successive foreign ministers whether sushma ji or jay shankar ji around the world countries that had not been visited for 20 30 40 years i mean greece was not visited for four decades uh, australia had not been visited for uh, you know like three decades uh, in our neighborhood countries like nepal and sri lanka had not been visited for a decade and a half two decades now what kind of foreign policy was that if you do not engage your immediate neighbors at the level of the prime minister and if you do not set your neighborhood uh, in order through this kind of active diplomacy you cannot have results our neighborhood first policy is very active today the kind of work that we are doing in the maldives where we have been able to kind of flip over uh, what was earlier an adverse situation under yamin we have done exceptionally well when you look at how the prime minister uh, you know and these are facts they have to be noted for what they are that when he goes on overseas trips uh, he uses even night halts at the airport uh, to do work it is not unusual to have the prime minister meet people at the airport at 2 am in the morning while the aircraft is being refueled in the earlier days when i was osd press relations uh, in the 1990s we would go off to a five star hotel and sleep it off and come back the next morning uh, but none of that currently the ability to engage the diaspora 32 million people i have never seen the diaspora in all my long years in the foreign service ever being engaged in the same manner the the way in which uh, our embassies have been made accountable and uh, responsive to the needs of indians overseas today indians are doing extremely well overseas they're being tapped into uh, in terms of their contributions to strengthen our foreign policy interests in those countries but also to get them to invest in a rising india to be part of the process here beyond that the use of indian lexicon the use of indian idiom the use of foundational indian strategic thought to formulate our policies to express our foreign policy and strategies i mean there is no point in talking about uh, you know uh, european strategic thinkers uh, when we have our own history of strategic thought in india indigenous strategic thought so all this and more uh, personal relations with leaders uh, how on earth do you think we get to cooperate with a country like saudi arabia and others like the ua with regard to intelligence sharing i served as the deputy chief of mission in saudi arabia in 1995 and 96 Uh, i could never have imagined having uh, intelligence cooperation or naval cooperation with saudi arabia or with the uae what is it that has enabled us to even get to large countries within the oic a community that's not otherwise very well uh, disposed towards uh, issues like kashmir and all to actually cooperate with us again a long answer to a short no but very comprehensive so thank you for that i mean the fact that you you asked for it every <laughs> uh, so with this again this leads on to the next question with the background that india is doing so well in terms of diplomacy uh, in terms of uh, you know expressing itself and taking the world along with it but there is always a question mark in everybody's mind the some article in the paper something in the news india and china where are we headed towards in this relationship so personally i believe that uh, it's a fact of history that india and china have to coexist 
and the preferred way to coexist would be through peace and cooperation but i would say emphatically as equals as equals and on the principles of mutual respect and so therefore it is very important for china to introspect its policies towards india when it demands that india have a good policy a friendly policy and positive policy towards china it is uh, dichotomous uh, to say the least if china does not have an equally positive and equally friendly relationship towards india and we don't see evidence of that so it cannot be a one sided relationship secondly there are issues like the long standing vestigial uh, legacy inherited problem of the india china boundary question uh, i mean people like me have grappled with it for decades tried to negotiate confidence building measures tried to put in place best practices so that our troops uh, you know are able to disengage uh, you know without any kind of uh, conflict but uh, uh, it's not good enough to sign agreements if one of the two sides is not committed to its implementation and so it's vital that china commits itself to the fullest implementation of consensus that was reached between the top leadership whether at wuhan whether at mamallapuram uh, where we had the informal summits or on the basis of the slew of agreements and protocols that we have put in place very diligently over past decades beginning with the border peace and tranquility agreement in 1993 the confidence building measures agreement in 1996 the guiding principles uh, and political parameters for resolution of the boundary question in 2005 attendant protocols there are so many protocols that we have put in place about behavior in the india china border areas how troops must disengage how they must behave when they run into each other in areas with uh, you know overlapping or contested claims there is this huge issue of the line of actual control that we must come to grips with what is the line of actual control india never had a line of actual control in the past we had only an international boundary the chinese created facts on the ground by claiming as chowan lai did through his letter of 7 november 1959 addressed to nehru that there is something called the line of actual control in uh, uh, you know uh, the western sector uh, in which china claimed that they were already there in aksai chin somewhere they were never there where they claimed they were they came up creepingly a salami slicing tactics a further compounded by the 1962 war uh, a slow creeping presence but by the mid 70s we also said we might have to negotiate with the chinese the world had changed bangladesh had been born the sino us relationship had been reset and india and china were also were also looking at a new kind of engagement after a hiatus of 14 years after the 1962 war we hadn't spoken to each other for nearly 14 to 15 years and when we did that of course one of the key requirements of good relations is to have a clear cut boundary i mean it's good fences that make good neighbors isn't it and if we don't have good fences how do you have a good neighborly relationship so china must come forth with regard to clarification of the line of actual control on large scale maps the only sector where we've been able to achieve this was way back Uh, two decades ago when we exchanged maps for the middle sector the middle sector is the smallest of the problems it is uh, 2000 square kilometers of contested territory but how about the much larger pockets in ladakh today where we are grappling with friction points where disengagement has not yet taken place like the deep sang plains for instance where there are issues with regard to patrolling access etc or in demchok in the southern end of uh, ladakh where again there are contested claims in the eastern sector china claims the whole of arunachal pradesh in the western sector we claim the whole of aksai chin so we have to learn uh, to be equals and china cannot uh, keep its markets closed deliberately against indian products it cannot demand that india open up everything whereas china will have the freedom to decide what comes in from india this kind of unilateralism even in economic relations is responsible quite apart from what you might say are structural differences if i speak to a chinese economist he'll say look don't blame us this is because of structural differences in the economy that you have an adverse balance of trade in excess of 100 billion dollars 
but i don't quite see it that way i think there is a great deal of what you call unfair policy towards india which results in such things so we must coexist but as equals it's uh, uh, you know a world in which there is probably enough place for both to coexist as successive leaders have said whether it was tang xiaoping who told rajiv gandhi in 1988 and i was desk officer for china even then i was part of that visit uh, whether it is dr manmohan singh whether it is uh, prime minister shri narendra modi all have spoken about there being enough space in asia for two great civilizations to coexist but as equals thank you for again the elaborate uh, answer one last question is uh, on the indian currency the indian rupee becoming as one of the main currencies for trading in fact uh, uh, there are a few countries with whom now we already do uh, rupee business so i think uh, if, uh, if if you could just give your view on that Uh, this time around i'll genuinely try to give a short answer <laughs> because uh, the movers and shakers of the indian rupee are here in the room and i dare not say much but you see my point is that uh, uh, you know a currency uh, becomes a dominant currency or an internationally accepted currency on the basis of your economic power uh, and by economic power i also mean your export power uh, what kind of uh, balance of trade you have as uh, and i think we have to work harder in that regard i'm sure we're going to touch 1 trillion dollars in terms of exports in the near future but will that be enough we have to look at uh, how is our trade structured today what is the domestic savings rate uh, how much are we actually doing with regard to exports uh, to the uh, you know dynamic parts of the world Uh, i believe that the preponderant part of our exports today is still to traditional economies in the west which are already showing signs of deflation germany is officially going into some kind of uh, recession um so uh, we have to look at our tariff rates if our tariff rates are very high uh, then our supply chains are going to be more expensive and distorted it will also have an impact on our exports so i think from my uh, you know sort of uh, lemons point of view um, i should say that india has to work very hard and proactively as it's been doing to up its game with regard to exports this is going to be tall order in a world where there isn't much appetite right now the economies are flagging everywhere uh, markets are not simply available there's a lot of competition if a country like china is finding the the, the headwinds there Uh, no doubt india will also face these headwinds secondly get the neighborhood right if the neighborhood accepts india's rise if there is greater uh, intra south asian trade which currently is woeful at about 4.5% compared to intra regional trade that we've seen uh, in latin america or southeast asia uh, we will be able to prop up the rupee also well countries like sri lanka are already showing interest because of the recent uh, dependence on india uh, in terms of bailing them out the 4 billion dollars that we have given and the commitments that we have, we have made so let the economy speak for itself um and uh, till then let us also not uh, run away from what is obviously the dominant currency uh, like the us dollar uh, virtually everything particularly commodities whether it is uh, energy whether it is rare earths whether it is other resources they are all denominated in us dollars uh, the, the road to any uh, export destination runs through uh, banks in the united states of america and uh, no harm there because uh, the dollar is still a, the greenback is still a good bet thank you again for your answer with this uh, we will take a few questions uh, from the audience uh, and i see a few hands uh, Yes, at the corner. Yeah. Well, I don't see the Russia-Ukraine war uh, ending uh, very quickly. Certainly not as imagined uh, by the West. Uh, for the war has, uh, you know, been going on for more than a year and a half. Um, 
it's taken the Russians by surprise. If uh, they thought they would walk in and mop up the place very quickly, uh, that didn't happen. If the West thought that they would, uh, you know, prop up uh, Ukraine as a frontline state with the latest gadgetry and weaponry and uh, beat the Russians back, that has not happened. Look, the short point on this is that uh, it's uh, very easy to cross red lines. And I do believe that uh, while uh, Russia's war in Ukraine seems as senseless as any other war, bringing about death and destruction and, and disruption, um, the red line, as far as Russia is concerned, was crossed. It's also very difficult to defeat a superpower, even a former superpower, uh, in its own backyard. We have seen umpteen examples of superpowers being defeated in geographies beyond their own. We have seen the uh, defeat of uh, uh, the United States in Vietnam. We have seen how even in the Korean Peninsula, the Korean War between 1950 and 53, General MacArthur was beaten back after he had reached the Yalu River uh, way up north. Uh, he was beaten back by the communists, by Kim Il-sung and his uh, you know, uh, band. Uh, to the 38th parallel, we have seen how two superpowers had to beat a retreat from Afghanistan. But give me one example of a superpower being beaten on its own turf. That's the question you'll have to ask. Can Russia be beaten there? My own answer would be a very skeptical no. So the only route to a solution, if you want an early end to that war, is to go by what Prime Minister Modi said. Now is not the era of war. Do it through peaceful negotiations. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Irama Loyal. So the question is regarding the defined boundary between India and China, that is LSE. The first of all, why we are having Galwan and all such issues is because first of all, LSE is not defined. And I guess it was 1993 when the last agreement happened between two countries where uh, we discussed at least. No, 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 no. We've discussed this ad, ad nauseum even after that. But, then, but sir, I'll give you the facts. So, uh, so why such delay? And do you think India has already missed the bus? Because it's going to, because uh, when we read uh, the confusion, whether with regards to Nanda being the last uh, checkpoint or Raja being the last army point, and there is a, because China thinks that's their era, area, and we think that that's our area. So there is no defined boundary uh, with regards to LSE. Then did we actually miss the bus? No, we've not missed the bus. Uh, I, I began by telling you that India and China were suddenly thrust in the late 40s in a situation where loosely defined frontiers overnight had to become boundaries. That itself was a challenge. Where exactly is the boundary? We, for instance, claimed the boundary along the Kunlun range in Ladakh. The Chinese were claiming a boundary along the Karakoram. And in between lies this huge expanse of Aksai Chin, uh, 38,000 square kilometers currently under adverse occupation by China. In the eastern sector uh, in 1950, uh, it is uh, Major uh, Bob Khating, erstwhile of the Assam Rifles, who was able to take a contingent out to Tawang and uh, secure our interests along the watershed as defined by the Makmon line. And therefore, since then, NEFA, which is subsequently uh, after 1987, following statehood known as Arunachal Pradesh, it's an integral part of India. But there are overlapping claims. It's very clear. Uh, and uh, this is like a Matrushka doll. You know, you open a Russian Matrushka doll and there's a doll within a doll. And then you open that and there's a further doll. So the India-China conundrum when it comes to the boundary question is like that. There is the fundamental dispute over territory, large, expansive territory. They claim Arunachal, we claim Aksai Chin. Then within that, there is the Matrushka doll of differences over the line of actual control. They have a unilateral definition, which we cannot accept, for they were never there where they claimed to be uh, in 1959. As I said, they, they only came up incrementally. And most of this adverse uh, sort of uh, definition that they gave to the LSE took place much earlier, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It's not new. Um, the issue here is that you cannot move forward on the line of actual control unless you are ready to sit down as required 
under the 1993 and 96 agreements to exchange maps. Large scale maps have to be exchanged on which we show our line of actual control and they show their line of actual control. It may give you two lines on a single map, but at least you will know exactly where you are or where you claim you are and where he is and where he claims he is. Once that is clear, you can address the differences. You can go in for some kind of, uh, you know, joint survey. You can go in for some joint demarcation, delineation on a map or a demarcation on the ground. If there are some differences that can be ironed out without drastically, uh, you know, altering or trading territory, it is possible to, you know, define uh, things like that. Was that attempted? Yes, we attempted it. We did succeed. Uh, I was part of that exchange that took place in initially, formally in the year 2000. Between 96 and 2000, that is precisely what I was trying to do. And we did finally exchange maps on the middle sector. But then when we decided to uh, do the same thing with regard to the western sector, a much more complex exercise because there are many parties in the fray there. You have the whole of POK. You have this whole business of Pakistan having handed over the Sh Shaksgam Valley trans Karakoram tract to China uh, in Gilgit, Baltistan. Uh, and when we tried to discuss clarification and confirmation of the LAC there, the Chinese would always say, no, but you are claiming uh, more territory uh, uh, as a result of this map making exercise. You're not where you claim to be. Well, one could say the same for the Chinese. The issue here is not to say where exactly is your last post? What is your perception of the LAC? That is what we have to you know, negotiate out there. So we've not been able to do this. If we are able to do it, we will be able to address the first problem, which is line of actual control. Uh, without prejudice to either side's position on the bigger problem, the territorial dispute itself. Thank you. We'll just take three quick questions. Uh, yes. Uh, my name is Janak Nanavati, and I have a couple of uh, observations to make to you. Uh, your lecture reminds me of uh, Jagat Mehta, the, the foreign secretary in Vajpayee and other governments. Of course, I'd never heard him, but my father used to talk a lot about, about him, and his son was with us in Mayo. Um, I know him. Yeah, and uh, secondly, I wanted to tell you about uh, the, uh, what you took by way of education from this city, from BK. You have given us a lot of information by flow of, uh, as a shower of a lot of information and knowledge. That's good. I think you will do. You you have done a good proud to our uh, Madhav Kakkar and Abadi Sab, of course, right? So, and Ruxana Pathan and so many yeah, others. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Now I wanted you know I have a few observations to make. The one is about China. What uh, we heard about China having one child policy. Did that really help China in in some way or the other? The second is about. You know, we have this... Uh, so, uh, Jagat Mehta, China's population policy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that, that was the background. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm about, just filing uh, it up. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Um, China, uh, uh, we have the Dehradun Academy for IES, IFS, and all those people. Oh, Masuri, sure, you mean? Masuri. Masuri, Masuri, yeah, Masuri, yeah. sorry. Uh, so, uh, China also must be having that. So what has really helped China to grow? Is this the politicians or the bureaucracy or you know what has yeah. gone into China? So very to... complex <laughs> web of questions. <laughs> yeah. The first is oh you haven't finished. I think because I mean there are yeah, two yeah, other people second. in the, the line. Is about <laughs> DRDO. You are going to head the DRDO as I understand. No, I'm not going to head the you're DRDO. Going to I'm going to bring it down. <laughs> So I wanted to talk to you later about DRD because I myself am connected with DRD in one way or the other. We'll talk about it. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. Okay, Great. I'm trying to remember. Jagat Mehta, I have utmost respect for him. I knew him as uh, a very senior member of our tribe. Um, by the way, he did uh, a job that I did uh, for several years, being director China in the Ministry of External Affairs. And he was, of course, instrumental in the official level, level negotiations in 1960 at a very complex uh, time in history. As far as China's single child policy is concerned, it started in 1979 uh, and uh, uh, it was actually discontinued uh, around 2016 uh, when they allowed uh, China, uh, you know, the people of China to have two children. Um, 
there were exceptions made for uh, people who uh, you know had a, uh, a child with uh, a differently enabled child or things like that but uh, that has been discontinued in recognition of the fact that china might age before it becomes truly rich it's got an aging issue there um and um, uh, what was the last part of your complex web of questions sorry yeah what what makes it's certainly not wolf warrior diplomacy that's getting them anywhere in fact that's something that's earning them a bad name i think china grew uh, seriously speaking china grew because of a combination of factors in the late 70s uh, the united states was looking at a reset uh, and it found in china a uh, potential fertile ground for planting investments technology going in for what you call uh, you know low cost high volume manufacturing uh, to lower costs uh, labor arbitrage was a key advantage uh the fact that the chinese could work on a system and deliver over time create a, a hub and spokes kind of uh, uh, you know situation there uh, all that helped china to source investments it began with the overseas chinese also uh, showing the way forward overseas chinese from uh, you know neighboring regions like uh, singapore hong kong uh, and elsewhere uh, took that plunge uh, united states took that uh, you know a uh, leap of faith so to speak japan followed europe followed uh china's ability to uh have disciplined and adequate numbers of labor on site its delivery of uh, infrastructure its ability to uh, do scaled up production of the type that we cannot even dream of in india except in it uh, if you can replicate what you do in it in manufacturing we would have been able to match uh, china so china has done things uh, in a certain way uh, with its uh, uh, strong authoritarian model uh, enabling them as well uh, we obviously cannot hope to replicate them with regard to authoritarian systems but we can always try to do the rest you know uh yes please uh, keep the question uh, brief and actually he is uh, hinting to me that i should keep the answer <laughs> brief but he is a diplomat you know? <laughs> i can read into what he says uh hi this is uh, vaishali zinzuwadia and sir uh, we met in uh, sydney as well as mexico my question is um, how india should take advantage of this geopolitical war going on between russia and ukraine how to tap the neighboring markets like uzbekistan kazakhstan azerbaijan uh, which is dominated dominated by russia and china how indians should uh, penetrate in the market and is it a right time to strike a chord because where our exports are merely less than 1% how should we go well i can agree with you that central asia the eurasian landmass is ripe for india to tap uh, particularly because we have a civilizational connect Uh, it's a 3 hour flight from delhi to almaty uh, or, or to tashkent uh, and um, or to 3 and 1/2 uh, hour flight to astana i was there recently in astana and it took me only 3 and 1/2 hours um so this is an area that we must uh, uh, you know capitalize on focus on central asia um we are looking at central asia in terms of uh, uh, connectivity projects but Uh, some of that physical connectivity that historically and civilizationally existed between us and uzbekistan is difficult today because of the realities of geopolitics pakistan is in between we have seen the difficulties with regard to the tapi uh, energy pipeline it never really saw the light of day we have seen how even with regard to afghanistan we have found it very difficult uh, to have connectivity except through uh, chabahar Uh, and uh, kandla for ex- or 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 uh, uh, navasheva port etc through the sea route uh, or the uh, air corridor which is uh, never you are an airman yourself you know it's very expensive to fly planes in and out of afghanistan carrying uh, you know dry fruits and things like that um you you, you exactly there's no insurance cover out there so i think uh, to to be able to really clinch it on central asia 
we will have to have the right kind of margins in trade. We will have to have the right kind of connectivity in place. Uh, but India's soft power is radiating through that region. I mean, I have an annual visit to that part of the world. Uh, you know, more recently I was in Kazakhstan and I could see, like in Uzbekistan and elsewhere, that there is great potential. Um, so we should be doing much more. Uh, I don't know whether it should all be done through transshipments or, uh, you know, other routes. Um, but um, in terms of technology, in terms of uh, education, IT, uh, there's a lot of scope there. Please. Not in Japanese. Uh, okay, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to still he's want a, to He's a very good Japanese speaker and uh, has translated for our leaders for many years in the past. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, it was wonderful listening to you. Worth coming all the way from Delhi. <laughs> and Rajivi, thank you for convening and wonderful comparing and questioning. Last question. I want to bring you back to the romance of Three Kingdoms and bring Japan again in, in the context of China. You were personally involved in probably, you know, the toughest time Abe was facing in his career. You brought him to Ahmedabad and, you know, came back, probably he was one of the best friend India ever had. And you now starting from world, moving from Asia, Pacific to Indo-Pacific, to the Quad and so many things, obviously uh, with enough support from India as well. My question now is that um, how China looked at that relationship, India-Japan coming to closer, and post Abe, uh, especially with Kishida to next generation of leaders, how are they viewing it and what is the future going forward? Thank you. As I'd say, the broad contours of uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe's line on India, uh, the big bet that he placed on India continues. Uh, in the post-Abe period, I think the underpinnings are very strong. Uh, and they've been continued by Prime Minister Suga and, uh, Prime, uh, and, and Kishida as well. Um, the issue here is one of relative... Uh, dependency on China. Look, at the end of the day, despite their geopolitical differences, their uh, territorial differences, uh, Japan is very heavily invested in China. Uh, and for long it has felt the, the, the uh, you know, restrictive burden um, of that relationship uh, when it comes to its choices vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, the geopolitical choices that it makes are defined by its economic interdependence with the People's Republic of China. Most of Japan's supply chains are all emanating out of uh, China and it's proved mutually beneficial. So that's a hard case to, to reject for uh, Japanese industry. Uh, Japanese industry is comfortable with Southeast Asia as well. Uh, for uh, many Japanese businessmen, Asia ends with Southeast Asia. South Asia, India are further away. It's almost like going to the Middle East for them. At the political level, the concept of the Indo-Pacific that was promoted by Prime Minister Abe has brought us closer together. And Japan has become uh, one of our major investors in the Indian economy. In cumulative terms, more than 35, 36 billion US dollars. Uh, it's a very key player in all the uh, you know, uh, milestone infrastructure projects in India. Uh, it has transformed the Indian economy in the automotive sector through Suzuki's entry uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. And now we are looking at a similar transformation for our high-speed railway. So the fundamentals are all there. Uh, the political equation is very good. The economic part is uh, burgeoning. But we have to encourage Japan to look at uh, India even more extensively as part of their China plus policy. They have a China plus policy for they know that it is not good to put all eggs in one basket. At the same time, their companies need to make money. They need to be able to get the right kind of response at the ground level from local governments in terms of infrastructure, power, ability to export, uh, you know, warehousing, uh, you know, delivery schedules, all this matters. Um, and uh, you see, some time ago, if you remember, in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic, the Japanese uh, had a relocation package. You must have heard about that uh, $3.2 billion uh, package. Uh, $3 billion were for relocation back to Japan, and $200 million uh, was 
part of that package for relocation to third countries as part of China Plus strategy. Um, there were, I read uh, statistics that there were 89 companies in first flush during that period that relocated. Uh, a full uh, 57 companies, Japanese companies relocated back to Japan. So that part, I think, of their objective was fulfilled. Uh, though I'm not sure how economically viable Japan would be as a, manuf as a manufacturing hub because it's so expensive out there. Um, and uh, then there were 30 companies that relocated to Southeast Asia. There were two companies that came into India. Uh, therein also lies a story that if you want to get Japan to come in more uh, into the Indian economy, we will have to do a lot of heavy lifting uh, at our end. Uh, more of Japan in the Indian economy. But there are ways to do that also, not just through investments. Skills development, as we tried to do during my time through the Japan-India you know, uh, institutes of, of manufacturing, the gyms, or on the reverse side, taking Indians out under the technical intern training program, now known as the Specified Skilled Workers Program. Uh, again, something that I had, uh, you know, midwife uh, conceptualized to get more Indians in the job market in Japan. If they were to come back with the skill sets after, say, three, five, seven years, for none of them will be given permanent, uh, you know, residence in Japan, they can act as the nuclei for further change in the Indian economy with best practice. So you can have a prairie fire thereafter in terms of how uh, managers work and, and guide corporations and things like that. There are ways of benefiting them. Thank you. Uh, last question, uh, Rohit Bhai. Sir, it's very clear that we cannot fight the dragon head on. But you cannot fight who? The dragon. Oh, the dragon. <laughs> right. But uh, see, post corona, when we are going out for our existing businesses, ongoing businesses for exports, there is uh, unwritten acceptance that China was responsible for this epidemic. And we are given clear preference as long as we are at par for the businesses, which was not earlier. So how do we diplomatically can exploit this? A short answer to Except that would large... be, you know, don't try to go toe to toe with China. It's an economy that's six times the size of the Indian economy. Don't try to get into a cage fight, as the Americans would say, with the People's Republic of China. What we need to do is to capitalize on our advantages. We have many advantages. And we have to look at geographies where we have greater credibility. Today, there is a great pushback against the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, this is not to say that India can be a substitute for such expansive connectivity projects with the same kind of funding as the Chinese have in the same geographies. But we are not doing too badly in our region. Uh, and so we have to, you know, kind of up our game uh, where we have some advantages. Uh, I, I would say we have to work with like-minded partners. Uh, we have to work with countries like the United States, Japan, Australia, in the broader Indo-Pacific. Um, utilize some of our historical uh, connectivity and advantage that we have in Africa. Uh, but accountability, responsibility, shorter delivery, having special purpose vehicles that uh, are created and can deliver on time, these are crucial because there is a reputational cost there. If you don't get it right, it takes years to undo the damage. Uh, but we have done well. Afghanistan is another example. I mean, we're such a big stakeholder there with $3.5 billion of investment, virtually every big project there, including the parliament, the Zaranj Dilaram Road, the Pule Kumri transmission lines, power station, the store palace. Uh, so much more has been done by us out there. And so we are capable of doing it. But who will do it? It's not government that can do it. Government should not do it. It's the private sector. But the private sector will do it if there is money to be made. It's not for the milk of human kindness that they will go and carry out these projects. So the strategy has to be well thought out. Uh, business houses must be convinced that when they go out, they will make uh, the right kind of uh, profit margins. And then we have nothing but the best of you know, brains in the private sector in India. You give them a go at it, they will do it very well. In fact, less of government interference, more of 
private sector taking the lead for the right reasons we can do it thank you sir <clears throat> with this uh, we end uh, this session it's been engrossing it's been engaging and uh, with this before we get on to the formal vote of thanks i request uh, achal bhai to come and give a small memento to it look small. Uh, i mean in terms of its aura it's very big and we have just given you on relative basis to its aura it is small <laughs> symbolic of amdavad it's the atal bridge the walking bridge uh, across the river Uh, with this, I request uh, uh, Savan Bai to come and give the vote of thanks, please. No, no, no. Wow, that was a lot of energy. You know, and as you were mentioned, engrossing, engaging. Then I would add enlightening, energizing, and many more. <clears throat> Ambassador Sujan Chinoy, past. The presidents of AMA, office bearers, ladies and gentlemen. Certainly something worth taking home. Absolutely so much of knowledge, so much of information, so much of passion that we could see in Ambassador Chinoy. And certainly so much of aura that you use the word that, that you, you displayed. Sir, it was absolutely mind-blowing and, and we feel only lucky to be having you here. Certainly, certain points, you know, just in a two minutes, I'll wind it up. But very important, the world upside down. And, and you've mentioned that the fractured world. Right? It has never been more complex. The geopolitical situation, I think, would never been as complex as, the, as it is today. And the last three, four years captured in the book. And I, had, uh, I have gone through some pages fast, but something which is going to be, anybody takes up in the evening will certainly finish it before they go to bed, even if it is morning. So that's the book that here it is. Of course, China, one good piece of advice on not to be taking on head on head or toe to toe, toe, toe. But uh, certainly China, actually, sir, what you mentioned, very important. India is at a better stage than what China was in 1971 or 1945. Or when, when actually People's Republic of China replaced the China, um, Republic of China as the permanent member. And all the reasons that the question Rajiv Bhai asked that why should we not be having, you know, us as a permanent member also. But more than that was that it is whether because of the Security Council or in spite of the Security Council that India is going to grow. So that, that's the big question ahead of us. Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the philosophy that is going to help us grow more than uh, you know, there is no permanent friends or enemies, as uh, Sir mentioned, there are only permanent interests, as I could recollect. Certainly, the friends here, Mr. Shukla, you, you gave an introduction, and of course, so many things, Sir, rifle shooting, NCC, and some lost of languages, and he also speaks Hindi and English, Hindi and Gujarati. <laughs> so, out of a lot of them. Certainly, the friends would be only proud. If I had a friend like you, if, if, who is my classmate, I would only say I'm a fan of yours, even as a friend. Yeah. <laughs> that will take up over that. But, but ladies and gentlemen, of course, thanks, uh, uh, Ambassador Sujan Chinoy. And thanks, one, for authoring this book to give us this so much of wealth of knowledge that we would take home big, out from the book also. Thanks for coming here. Thanks, Rajiv Bhai, for, you know, having this program that uh, in place with all your effort right from having and and certainly th and thanks ladies and gentlemen certainly we we are very lucky to have today all the knowledge that we have had one one uh, uh, in, important announcement that uh, uh, ambassador sujan chino has kindly consented he will sign off the book books are available outside so if you uh, uh, look at it, he, he would be glad to sign that off also. Thanks again. Please join us. Thank you.
Also, please join for refresh refreshments outside, sir.